Hello everyone! Every now and then I like to share with you what I've been reading lately. Uh, lately is um, an arbitrary meaningless term in this instance because, well, there's no schedule for when I release these things, and the last time I did one was... February? Maybe? If, if that even counted as one? So, yes, it's been quite a while. I did have this on the to-do list going back a couple months, but I I just decided to wait. So here we are! <laughs> Here's a random collection of short book reviews, starting with number one, a book called Mystery at Deer Hill by Virginia Francis Voigt. This is a late 1950s novel for young people about a girl who reluctantly agrees to skip her usual summer vacation at the beach with friends to go up instead to a small town in the middle of nowhere in Maine to stay with her aunt. She ends up falling in love with the place, making new friends, and getting involved in a mystery. But not a, oh no, someone's been murdered mystery, more of a nature mystery. Uh, this is a charming little time capsule. It's a bit, um, a bit preachy, but not in a, not in an insufferable way, and every aspect of the story is handled with gentleness. It's a cozy, pleasant little book. Number two and number three are Tarzan of the Apes and Return of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. I've had Tarzan of the Apes on my reading list for a long time, and I wasn't sure what I would think of it, but it turns out I really liked it. It's an exciting, engrossing novel that starts with a bang and has lots of twists. There are moments of tragedy that are poignant and effective. Tarzan is a likable and smart protagonist. Of course, you have to take some things with a grain of salt. The number of vicious, brutal fights and attacks that he survives are incredible. <laughs> and the thing that required me to stretch my imagination the most was his keen ability to educate himself. He teaches himself to read and write English just by poring over his father's books, which is impressive enough. But then later, he learns to speak French fluently and to behave as a model gentleman in society in just two months. Unbelievable. <laughs> Other than that, though, I thought the conveyance of animal culture, the social structure of the ape tribe, was well executed. That was far more interesting than I ever thought it would be. The story also develops differently from the movies that I've seen, which is basically the Johnny Weissmuller films and the Disney movie, Jane and Company, who you think of as being, uh, you know, kind of the main part of the story, them coming and finding him, uh, they come into it quite late and they have mostly shadowy interactions with Tarzan up to a certain point. Jane makes one foolish mistake, but other than that, she's a pretty decent character, not cowering in fear, speaking up when she disagrees with the general consensus. I was pleasantly surprised by this one, so while I had no plans to read the sequel before, uh, when it ended with this twist, I said, I don't know what happens next, so I just had to get the second one. Fortunately, it was available on Overdrive, and that's where things kind of went <laughs> because I thought Return of Tarzan was just okay. I liked it, but not as much as the first one. I've seen online that there are people who like it just as much as the first one, or like it even better, um, but I didn't feel that way. Uh, I found Tarzan's adventures in France and North Africa to be uh, repetitive and predictable. They felt like filler. I started skimming through them. I thought it was pretty silly how he's always coming in contact with beautiful women who will help him. It's a sequel, though, and it's actually more like the second half of the first novel and taken as such, taken as a two-parter, the narrative does have some interesting patterns and progressions. There is a... a, uh... a circularness. Oh, there's a word for that, but I can't think what it is. <laughs> 
the things come around full circle. Uh, there's excitement and lots of thrills, lots of coincidences with ships passing each other, people turning out to know each other, events repeating. Um, at one point, some characters end up in a lifeboat, and survival cannibalism looms in the distance, so that was cool. You know, I like stories where people contemplate the ethics of having to eat each other. Let's not go down that road. Again, I was surprised by the ending, but, um, whereas with the first ending, I felt like, Whoa, this is crazy! I have to know what happens next! This time, it was more like, oh, huh, okay. Well, I guess that works. Eh. <laughs> so, I don't anticipate reading more in the series. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, I was happy enough with the first two, and uh, I'm glad I read them. I enjoyed them. One more than the other. <laughs> and definitely they're different from the movies. Um, yeah. Number four is Would Like to Meet by Rachel Winters. This is a romantic comedy that I found, um, pretty forgettable. It's about a young woman who's a literary agent who is trying to advance her stagnant career. She's challenged by a difficult client to prove that meet-cutes can really happen in real life by having one happen to her, or something like that forcing one to happen to her, which is not what a meet-cute is at all. Um, I, I thought the premise was appealing in the blurb, but in execution, it just wasn't there. A, a, a big part of it had to do with the main character. I just didn't like her. Didn't think she was very smart. Didn't like the manipulativeness of the whole thing. It's the author's uh, first novel, and, um, well, I wish her luck with future endeavors. Number five is The Langoliers by Stephen King. In this one, a commercial flight passes through an anomaly, and a small group of people on board wakes up to find the rest of the passengers and the crew have disappeared. They manage to land the plane at an airport, but it is seemingly abandoned. This is a novella, though it took me as long to read as a standard novel. It's not bad, not great. Um, I might have enjoyed it more if I hadn't seen the two-part miniseries adaptation from 1995 a bunch of times when I was younger. Um, it's been years since I saw it last, I think, so I thought that I wouldn't remember that much, but it turns out <laughs> I remembered everything. I kept recognizing descriptions, action, dialogue. You can't read Craig Toomey's lines without hearing them as they're said in the movie. It's actually uncanny how faithful the adaptation is. They're just two things, really, that they cut out, and they uh, trimmed down the swearing. Um, anyway, the book was okay. Um, I think it's a good premise. Gets a little confusing with some uh, plot elements, but that goes with the territory. It's good execution up to a certain point, and then it kind of fizzles. Um, I find that happens with a lot of Stephen King stories, though. I'm not really a fan. And what's funny is they both share the same major weakness, and that is the Langoliers themselves. A uh, bit of a letdown, but I won't go into that. Number six is Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. This is another novella I read. I kept choosing shorter stuff for some reason. This one's very popular in the bibliophile world. It's about a not-so-young woman who is stuck living with and working for her inconsiderate brother, who grabs a chance at adventure and freedom when she buys a book peddler's wagon. This was published in 1917, but it has some lines that still resonate. There is a fair amount of proselytizing and pontificating, um, but there are some good quotes, and I liked it well enough. The characters are charming. 
There's a sequel, The Haunted Bookshop, which some people think is better, some people think is worse. I don't know. I'll probably read it sometime. Number seven is Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Another quick read with very short chapters. Uh, this was my first Kurt Vonnegut book, and it was wacky. At times, it was really funny, and then at other times, it was depressing with an everything-is-meaningless-now attitude toward life and the end of the world, which is essentially what it's about. Um, there's a flippancy I didn't always gel with, and while it's well-crafted in how all things come together, it's pretty impressive, um, there are many threads to keep track of, and I was never sure which new characters or ideas were going to come up again and prove to be important, and which were just part of an amusing tangent. I realize it might have been confusing like that on purpose. I liked the book, and even really liked it in some parts, but it was strange, and there were some elements that I didn't care for. It was also an unusual case of the middle being more engaging than the beginning or the end. At least, that was my opinion. The reverse is more common. Um, I probably... I would like to give Slaughterhouse-Five a try, uh, although I do expect that that will be just as confusing, if not more so. Somewhere in here, I think it was at this point, I read and reviewed A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, and then I read number eight, Where Are the Children by Mary Higgins Clark, in which a woman who was charged with murdering her young children years ago finds history repeating itself when her secret is exposed and her children disappear. Based on one mediocre experience I had with a Mary Higgins Clark book that we had kicking around here for a long time, I don't remember what it was called, I had kind of a dismissive opinion of her, and I did not expect this to be any good. But when it landed in my lap, I decided to give it a try anyway when I saw how high the Goodreads rating is. Now, Goodreads doesn't always get it right. The average is sometimes horribly skewed and just ridiculous for the actual quality of the book. But in this case, I have to agree. I thought this was excellent. It's such a page turner. It has a great implementation of setting. It's very suspenseful. Good mystery. Unexpected twists. Tension that just almost drove me up the wall, and uh, neatly interwoven subplots that just come together really well <laughs> at a pivotal moment, and a creepy element that made my skin crawl, and I would issue the warning that this is not for kids probably because of that element. Um, I just flew through this, uh, and enjoyed it far more than I would have expected. Uh, so now I'm wondering, was I wrong about Mary Higgins Clark, or is this her best book? Should I read more? Uh, was I wrong about that book that I read a long time ago? Or was that just one of the not good ones? I don't know, I'm having an identity crisis. And number nine, I also read, finally, Herman Woke's World War II historical epic, The Winds of War. At 887 pages, it is the longest book I've read this year, but that will only stand until I have completed its 1039 page companion, War and Remembrance. Since I'm planning to review both books together as soon as I've finished this hefty tome, provided I don't brain myself with it, reading it in the middle of the night, um, I will hold off on talking about The Winds of War now, except to say, number one, it was very good, and number two, it was even more relevant and timely in its history and its fictional story than I anticipated. Um, yeah. 
So if you've been wondering what I've been reading in the last several months, here's your answer. I hope you enjoyed this video, and maybe you found something to check out yourself. And if you've read any of the books that I talked about, go ahead and share your thoughts on them in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.